Okay, so we're talking about national security for this chapter. And we're going to walk through um, the different types of tools that America has regarding its government and, and impact on foreign policy. Um, and then the different players in that system um, and how that system functions a bit. A bit of a, a historical background, too, of how we've used that. So the three main types of tools for American pol foreign policy um, are military tools, economic tools, and diplomatic tools. Obviously, um, military tools involves using the armed forces to um, back up, sustain, and enforce uh, American policy across the world. Right? So uh, whether you're using drones or boots on the ground or people training other forces or what have you. Um, there are military tools that our government has to enact its foreign policy. Economic um, tools. So with economic tools, they're becoming um, more powerful in the globalized world economy. And so an economic tool would be um, either kind of a carrot or a stick. And when we talk about carrot or stick, carrot is Kind of a benefit and the stick is kind of a, a detriment so when in the stick pile we have things like economic sanctions we can freeze other countries assets um, we can impose embargoes on the import and export of their goods um, those kind of things and we see that happening right now with russia um, when it support of the invasion of Ukraine, then um, America and, and much of the world imposed economic sanctions against Russia um, you know, related to different different things and those sanctions have had effect. The same thing is true of Iran. Uh, we've imposed economic sanctions on them for some of their behavior. And that is all being negotiated right now on the, the nuclear deal that is still pending with Iran. Um, part of that is um, involving reducing those economic sanctions, which have been effective, right? Um, but you can also have positive economic foreign policy, so trade agreements, um, you know, foreign aid, um, where we just support some policy around the world um, through a foreign government or other institution, and then. Um, you know, other other ways where economics, America has the biggest economy in the world and therefore can, can help um, use its economic power to shape um, foreign policy across the world. And then diplomatic um, tools, those are obviously um, Secretary of State um, is kind of the chief diplomat. Well, the president is the chief diplomat, but Right underneath um, the president would be the Secretary of State. And that's the head diplomat under the president who's in charge of um, maintaining relations um, with different foreign countries. And so um, diplomats are in charge of, uh, we have um, you know, different stations throughout the, the world and embassies where um, we have ambassadors that live in those countries are in charge of maintaining the relations with countries that we have embassies in, um, and those embassies serve a variety of functions. And the hope is diplomats can help s solve conflicts or issues through discussion, negotiation, and agreement, rather than having to resort to the, to the more um, extreme harm um, tactics of to enforce things like economic sanctions or even military force. Um, you know, economic sanctions, um, diplomatic discussions have, have taken place for a long, long time, and it's it's by far the, the quietest of the tools of seen there. It's, it's discussions and um, helping people kind of talk through issues. That's a great way to do things. You can't always solve that, right? Military is the oldest, but it's becoming more and more expensive and costly in terms of lives, treasure, and economy. Um, 
Here's just an overview of different interventions that we've had just in the Central American states um, since 1900. And as you can see there, um, a variety of these situations involved Cuba, um, but we also have Haiti and uh, basically trying to police our own neighborhood here um, and make sure that it doesn't spiral out of control. Um, but we've had several different interventions in Central America as shown here. <coughs> the different actors. Um, so you have oops, international organizations. So you have the United Nations. Um, coming out of World War One, it was the League of Nations, but then that was defeated. America didn't want to be a part of it. And after World War II, the, the need was definitely there to have a body like that where grievances could be could be aired and the hope with that would be able to avoid um, world catastrophe. And we saw in the Cuban Missile Crisis where um, Russia and the United States were on the brink of nuclear war, the United Nations provided a, an area where they could talk and discuss things um, with other people around in a helpful way, right? And the UN still tries to provide that function um, throughout a, a number of different topics today as well. Um, and so, you know, at the top would be the United Nations. There's the UN Security Council that um, America also sits on. And on the UN Security Council, they vote on harsher measure, measures of enforcing the UN. Um, but each one of the members of the Security Council, and it includes, you know, United States, Great Britain, France, Russia, China, um, you know, big the big countries with large um, militaries and whatnot to help enforce security around the world. But each one of those has a veto power. You have regional organizations. Um, NATO is one. Since Russia has become more aggressive again um, in Ukraine, NATO was kind of seen as as a side thing before. Now NATO has stepped back up as a more important organization again in confronting Russia, um, similar to what happened in the Cold War, though we're, fought, we're a long ways away from the Cold War. The European Union um, has been put under some stress from the Great Recession as countries like Greece and Spain and other countries like that um, have dealt with you know, the stronger economies in Germany and Great Britain. The idea when the U European Union, Union was first formed was that um, it would provide maybe a check to the United States in terms of its uniformity. Um, and if everyone could kind of get on board with a common goal of being European, um, then, you know, that unity um, may really pay off. Well, what we've seen with the Great Recession is um, the economic problems in the different countries has really stressed the idea, or really put stress on the idea that we're all Europeans, right? People still identify as Germans, um, you know, as uh, as the Dutch, as, as English, and that kind of thing. Um, they're pointing fingers more and saying this is a Greek problem that needs to be solved. It's not a European problem, right? Um, so we wouldn't say that in the same way if, if you know, California or Illinois had terrible debt. Um, we wouldn't really see that. Oh, that's just Illinois' issue, right? The federal government would be involved in doing some of that. Multinational corporations. So you don't discount the importance of you know, an oil company, an, a global oil company, because they will have a tremendous amount of authority, um, especially if they've gone into a smaller country to um, develop the oil there. That's largely to be the most, you know, largest, most fun, well-funded company in that small country, and they're going to be able to create a kind of an army of politicians and support in that small country and enact policies to support them. Um, but not just oil companies, you have tech companies as well um, who want to relocate overseas to get a lower tax rate. And those companies 
will play a large role in kind of shaping, especially in the global economy, what foreign policy looks like, especially on, um, you know, kind of um, intellectual property. So movies, video games, music, that kind of stuff. Um, in a globalized economy with the internet, the sale of internet or the movies and, and music and video games over the internet um, is going to make piracy, you know, like taking movies and downloading them illegally, it's going to be one of the big issues. And China is kind of one of the biggest violators of that. Um, and it's a foreign policy issue. Non governmental organizations, um, so this is like the Red Cross. Um, World Vision, um, you know, Doctors Without Borders. These are these organizations that kind of go in and provide aid in a lot of situations. They don't always have to be kind of disaster emergency aid kind of organizations. They can be organizations that promote democracy in certain countries. They can be organizations that um, are just not part of any kind of government. They're like a charity or a private foundation or just a private nonprofit organization um, attempting to impact a foreign country in some manner. Um, and so, you know, they have funding, they provide support in the other country. That's another actor on the stage. And then obviously individuals, right? Um, other individual leaders in both in the government and other countries as well as ours. So the policymaker, the president is still considered chief diplomat because that's when the president makes a visit to talk about diplomacy or a trade deal or settling a conflict or something like that. That's that's the really gets a lot of attention. So the chief diplomat would be considered to be the president. Right underneath the president, though, as you see there, as we talked about before, was the secretary of state, and then you have the whole all the office of the Secretary of State, all of the staff and diplomats and ambassadors across, across the country the country and world. Um, and, you know, there's there are quite a large number of, of those people in that office. The National Security Establishment, so you have the Secretary of Defense in the Pentagon, Joint Chiefs of Staff as the, head, the heads of each um, major branch of the armed forces. So each branch of the armed forces has a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and they advise the President on military matters. National Security Council and the CIA, right? The CIA's international um, intelligence um, spies and, and those kind of things. Congress, as we talked about before, they get to approve treaties. Um, We've seen recently that Congress invited the Prime Minister of Israel to speak. So Congress also can, they can take journeys into other countries, visit other countries. Um, and so Congress also plays an important role. <coughs> Quick history of American foreign policy. When George Washington um, served as president and then in his um, kind of farewell speech at, when he was leaving office, he warned the country to stay out of um, European conflicts, right? Um, and don't get don't get tied up in European foreign wars. And I think that was good advice at the time um, because America didn't have the, the money, the military, or anything to be getting involved in those kind of conflicts. However, um, eventually um, James Monroe issued the Monroe Doctrine, which we saw in Central, the conflicts that were and things in Central America in that previous slide. The Monroe Doctrine said um, to other countries, um, primarily European countries, that what happens in Central and South America, the um, United States will take care of that. They don't, European countries and other countries don't have the right um, to interfere in those matters. And if they do, the United States will check them with their military. Um, so that was a, laid out as a policy. Now in World War One, 
a lot of people still wanted isolationism, um, but you know, with the actions of Germany bringing us into the war in World War One, um, we got involved in World War One, um, and it was it was seen as you know ending the policy of isolationism. Although I have to say, World War Two, uh, we did not enter that conflict early, and a lot of that was because. The majority, vast majority of Americans did not want to go into World War II after what we would already gone in World War I. So FDR had to do a lot of convincing of the American public. And then obviously Pearl Harbor is what really brought us in. Um, but prior to Pearl Harbor, it had been very difficult to convince Americans that they should get involved in World War II, um, despite all the bad things Hitler was doing, because Americans felt like, that was not their fight, it was other people's fight. With the Cold War, um, you had the policy of containment, right, which led to the um, use of the military in Vietnam and Cambodia and North Korea, where in Korea, the North Koreans, supported by the Ch Chinese, were pushing for communism through all, all of Korea, and then the South Koreans wanted democracy, and they were supported by the United States and other countries, and we basically had a war in Korea over that over that um, particular fight. It was really over whether communism was going to come into Korea or not. Well, they ultimately settled and split half of it, right? North Korea became communist, South Korea remained free, but it was contained in the sense that it didn't take over the whole um, peninsula. Now, in Vietnam, the same thing was argued. We have to stop the spread of communism, otherwise it's going to go out, go through all of Asia, and all of Asia is going to be communistic, like the Chinese, right? So the policy of containment um, attempted to fight wars to prevent the spread of communism. And then obviously we had a whole host of each, during the Cold War, um, America projected power for, for foreign policy always kind of in line with checking the Soviet Union, right? Those were the two great superpowers going head to head across the, across the world. And part of that included building up a lot of military um, equipment, nuclear weapons, all that kind of stuff. And so we engaged in what was called an arms race with the Soviet Union, which is actually partially credited for bankrupting the Soviet Union and causing the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union. Um, as a result of Russia just could not pay for those kind of arms anymore. It, hadn't, it did not have the economic um, capacity because communism didn't work as well as <coughs> excuse me, capitalism. Um. <coughs> Detente, um, so this was a part of the Cold War um, where things in the Cold War started to get better between us and Russia. We started to slowly back away from um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which was kind of the height where we almost went to nuclear war with each other. Um, detente was kind of, we slowly backed away from that, started cooperating some more, um, had what are called the SALT talks, strategic arms limitation talks, so you see SALT 1, SALT 2, these are agreements where Russia and the United States agreed to reduce the number of nuclear arms that they had. Now, some of these are being challenged again now as, as Russia, um, seeks to get a little bit more aggressive again in the world. China also became part of those talks. During uh, Ronald Reagan's presidency, the defense budget had been reduced, um, and so slowly it had been reduced. Reagan came in and really wanted to spend up the arms race and increase the arms race. So he added a bunch of money to the defense budget, um, you know, to counteract the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union spent up as well. Again, this was money the Soviet Union didn't really have at 
the time, right? Which is partly what bankrupted it and led to the fall of communism, both in um, the Soviet Union and in all around the surrounding countries. The Strategic Defense Initiative, which is codenamed Star Wars, and this was the idea that we would put satellites in space and with the type of nuclear missiles that exist both then and now, the nuclear missile um, is shot off, let's say, from the United States. Um, in order to hit Russia, it actually leaves the atmosphere, goes into space briefly, right? Comes over and then would go on to the, the Russian target. Well, what Star Wars, <coughs> excuse me, what Star Wars was, was the concept that, all right, well, when Russia shoots those same um, missiles at the United States, we'll have some satellites in space, and those satellites in space will shoot lasers and blow up the, the missiles before they come back out, back into the atmosphere and towards the United States. So this is Ronald Reagan's great plan. It's going to be incredibly expensive, um, but they proposed that, and again, Russia's was concerned about it, even though it was pretty far-fetched at the time and still seems a bit far-fetched, <coughs> though not as much with missile defense systems and our, our laser technology is better now. Um, the Soviet Union was thinking, well, how in the world are the Soviet Union going to pay for that? And if American, America does develop it, that will shift the Cold War because America will be able to effectively shoot down Russian missiles. So during the presidency of George H.W. Bush, um, and don't underestimate, Mikhail Gorbachev was the leader of Russia at this time as well, of the Soviet Union. And um, George H.W. Bush um, worked with Gorbachev and got them to in a place where they could be integrated into the uh, world community more than they had been um, when they were communistic. So the fall of communism, Gorbachev kind of let it happen. George H.W. Bush spurred it along with um, his proposals, which he stuck by. Um, and so Gorbachev supported the ending of communism and then um, split up a lot of the a lot of the surrounding countries as well. East and West Germany. So East Germany had been under communism and controlled by um, Russia, whereas West Germany had been controlled by um, the West, so the United States and Europe. Um, it was democratic. And East Berlin and West Berlin had been separated right down the middle. And this is all following World War II when um, the United States and Great Britain and France um, had driven the Nazis back and took over the west part of Berlin, whereas the Rus Russians had come from the east. Well, at the end of World War II, they both just kind of held onto their territory and backed away. <coughs> Following the, the fall of the Soviet Union, um, east, and Germ east and West Germany became united again. Now, following 9-11, right, um, we had another shift, a major shift in foreign policy. So following the fall of communism happens in roughly the 1990s, early 90s, okay? And so from 90s, from the early 90s to 2001 when we had 9-11, um, we had, there was some foreign policy conflicts, but we were not engaged in a Cold War um, with anybody. There was acts of terrorism during that time as well that were concerning. Um, but there really wasn't kind of a grand narrative um, of American foreign policy. Well, that all changed with 9-11. Um, when the 9-11 attacks happened, America became fo focused on fighting the war on terrorism um, around the world against Al-Qaeda and those who support them and all, and all that kind of stuff. So our focus shifted um, overseas, right? So. Many people forget George W. Bush did not see himself primarily as a foreign policy president. Um, but now looking back, he's known probably more famously for his foreign policy 
in Iraq and Afghanistan than some of the other um, areas that he initially was going to focus on domestic issues. Well, when 9-11 happened, we began to look overseas and got very active in um, foreign affairs in kind of the the extremist world in Afghanistan, obviously. We removed the Taliban with a military action, um, and then Iraq and removing Saddam Hussein, and then the, the challenges of, of the uprisings in Iraq and in, and in Afghanistan um, and dealing with those uh, over the years, and we're still dealing with those, right? Um, so because we're not really dealing with countries per se in this terror war on terrorism, it's become very different and, and has to be improvised a lot, right? So even though ISIS calls itself a state and a country, it really isn't recognized by anybody. So how, could, how can we really deal with that? Um, and so we've seen military intervention um, against ISIS in the form of bombing raids and whatnot. Um, I'm sure there's diplomatic and other pressure being put on them as well. <coughs> <coughs> And how do politics come come into all of this? Well, defense spending and the defense budget, was you just talked about with Ronald Reagan, that really led and was one of the reasons that the Cold War ended, because the Soviet Union couldn't keep up with that. And defense spending currently takes up one-sixth of the budget. Um, and there's often a battle about, you know, the money that we spend on defense goes to American companies who create planes for America, and it provides jobs for America, all that kind of thing. Um, and so conservatives see that spending as more beneficial in a lot of ways um, because it provides jobs, keeps the money in America, all those kind of things, as opposed to other ways to spend that money. Um, and conservatives also argue we need a strong military um, to help keep us safe and help, you know, protect our values around the world. Um, liberals typically argue that defense spending should be cut and that money should be put into social programs, you know, welfare, um, or, you know, just more social programs to impact um, what they see as the common, common person. <coughs> A lot of jobs in congressional districts, so, um, for instance, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, um, has Rockwell Collins, which is a big maker of kind of aircraft technology and of defense aircraft technology. Um, and so if, if funding for military purposes was drastically cut, then that could mean the loss of jobs at Rockwell Collins and Cedar Rapids. So if you think about there's going to be those kind of industries in every state in one way or another. And so when you start talking about cutting defense spending, that means losing jobs in your district. And that doesn't get you reelected as a congressperson. So as a congressperson, you're somewhat incentivized to keep the military spending high um, so that the jobs in your state or in your jurisdiction will be maintained. Who's in the military? Well, there's roughly 1.4 million active and reserve troops combined. Um, <coughs> There's more and more reliance on the National Guard and Reserve troops to call up in a conflict. Um, we have the nuclear triad, intercontinental ballistic missiles. That's the ones I were talking about. Um, SLBMs and strategic bombers, those are all expensive. We now have drones, right? Drones is, is going to be where a lot of the action is going to be for a long time. Because um, not putting human lives in danger... Um, in very dangerous, sticky situations, provides an, a way to have military force without the loss of life, right? You might lose the drone, which costs you money, but it would be worse from a political standpoint for the president or whoever is authorizing the use of force. It would be much worse for that person, um, for the president, for instance, if that same, instead of a 
drone that was shot down in Iraq or something like that. It was a plane driven by an American fighter and they were captured and that would be a much worse outcome than if they just shoot down the drone, right? Which makes us more likely to use drones in a lot of situations. Treaties um, have been signed to reduce the number of nuclear weapons. Some of those are violated and sometimes Russia is saying we don't abide by them, we're not going to abide by them anymore. High-tech weapons like hacking, right? Stealing all the data from other other identification data from other countries is becoming more and more important. So kind of e-security issues um, are going to be a big, a big concern going forward because you don't want a nuclear, um, a nuclear power plant hacked and put into meltdown or something by some crazy, um, radical person who wants to destroy America. So all those things are going to become important um, and something to be watched for. Here's just a chart of shows trends in defense spending and <coughs> obviously when we're in a war it goes up and so here you have Reagan rearming. Gulf War went up briefly um, during the Clinton years it went down again because uh, they didn't have any major conflicts during that time. Um, and with the Iraq War, it starts to go up again, then goes down, and it stays relatively flat, according to this chart. There's just a show and a breakdown of um, active military. Um, the National Guard also helps with security here in the country on different things. Changing role of military power. There's the idea of soft power and hard power. So soft power is when the military comes in with helicopters after an earthquake um, to provide services to uh, <coughs> needy countries. Um, it can go into kind of you know rough zones that are under attack, not attack from Americans and not us in the war, but let's say it's somebody else is involved in wars. Our military gets brings in aid and, and humanitarian assistance. Um, it can be very dangerous to go into those places and, and give that kind of assistance. But um, the thought is that the countries that receive the assistance are often very thankful for that. Economic sanctions, we talked about that. Um, you don't have to be worried about people losing lives and whatnot for economic sanctions. Um, they're becoming more and more successful. We've seen some good success on those in Iran, which has gotten them to the bargaining table about nuclear weapons. Um, and then also we've seen it work in Ukraine where it's really had a hard, the impact of the economic sanctions on Russia has really hurt the Russian economy. Now, military power is still important, but it's just a messier solution and sometimes not the best solution to the situation. Um, so we're less likely to default into military action to resolve issues, right? We're more, we're more likely to engage in a, a large number of economic sanctions um, because if you do those correctly, it will hopefully hurt the, the president We'll have to hurt the people probably a little bit as well, um, but you know, it's it's a first step that can be used. Um, people argue, well, yeah, but that just closes off markets to the United States, um, and so it hurts the U.S. economy when we do that very thing. But um, economic sanctions can be um, an important tool. There's currently nine nuclear powers in the United States. So these are the countries that we know of that have nuclear weapons. United States, Russia, Great Britain, France, China, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel. Um, and so the question is always how do we prevent more? Um, right now that's being debated in Iran. So we're trying to work that out and for a long time we did not have much negotiations at all because <laughs> neither side could see how an agreement could come together. Well, we're much closer to an, an agreement about Iran. 
<coughs> regarding nuclear weapons. Excuse me. And so um, diplomacy in that situation as a result of the impact of economic sanctions um, will hopefully solve any nuclear issue preventing Iran from having a nuclear weapon. Um, and the important part about that is we don't have to even think or resort to any military option, which would be much more difficult and maybe counterproductive in Iran. And this just shows um, countries with nuclear weapons, countries that ended those programs, right? Um, Libya, as a result of economic sanctions, ended its program, and several other countries did as well. Um, okay. Okay, continuing on with nuclear proliferation. Only a few countries are known to have nuclear weapons. We looked at the list of them on the previous slide there. Um, and the fear is that either a terrorist organization will obtain a nuclear weapon or a country um, like North Korea um, that is not really in the, the global system um, or any kind of multinational organizations. And the concern is that one of those countries will get a nuclear weapon and then um, it will be difficult to um, and downright dangerous to work with them on a global stage and they might use those to um, blackmail or threaten other countries around them. And so the U.S. and a lot of other countries are working on um, prohibiting nuclear proliferation so we don't have more countries gain nuclear um, defense capabilities. <coughs> So the most recent um, situation we have in Congress, there's President Obama seeking a, a fast-track trade authority to complete a Asian uh, trade deal, and Congress is working on it, and the Republicans in Congress have helped Obama, but the Democrats disagree, and so that's one of those cases where the Republicans are helping the President out more than the the Democrats and his own party. In terms of international economy, so these trade agreements, like the one that we're trying to negotiate with Asia, we've had NAFTA and GATT, and there are ways to lower tariffs and just provide um, better trade status between the two countries. Tariffs are taxes on goods that come into the United States, and they're a way to use to protect American business. So if it's more expensive to purchase things overseas, the idea is through tariffs and otherwise we can make American products more affordable. And so some of these trade agreements talk about reducing the tariffs. Um, in terms of the balance of trade, that's the ratio between imports and exports, things coming out of the country, things coming into the country. Um, and with globalism, it's, it's hard to um, target things for import as things have come out and come back in and, and so on and so forth. So here's a listing of exports and imports in terms of the billions of dollars, right? The blue line re represents imports and the red line ex represents exports. <clears throat> and so and the positive of all these is it's all increasing. So that means that the economy was going up at that time. As you can see, following 2001, it starts to go back down and down, and then we've seen a another downward spiral as a result of the Great Recession, and then slight upticks since then. And so, uh, in terms of income and economic inequality, the um, countries in the Northern Hemisphere largely have stronger economies, more economic power than those in the Southern Hemisphere. And so, um, there's a lot of competition on the global stage between those economies that have not done great, um, but most of the power is, is concentrated in the countries um, that have a lot of economic power. Um, and so a lot of foreign aid in terms of um, 
economic money assistance, stimulus for economies, and those kind of things um, go from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. Well, when it goes from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere, a lot of the countries that are powerful in the northern hemisphere, including the United States, want something in exchange for the economic aid, the military aid, and those kind of things. And influence is one of those things that they're looking for. Um, foreign aid actually makes up a very, very small part of the budget, um, but it's still not popular for in any amount because people think, well, why are we giving money overseas when we have problems here at home? <coughs> but in the in the middle of a you know a flooding rainstorm in Haiti or an earthquake in China, um, it's hard to think that we shouldn't be sending some humanitarian aid to help people in that situation. So, question is, what percentage of our economy is spent on economic and humanitarian foreign aid? The answer is the smallest number there, the one percent. Right, so very small percentage of our overall economy is spent on those things. So energy, and the big change um, in this direction is is the fracking. So America now has access to a lot more oil, natural gas, and natural resources than we ever thought was the case. Now that the fracking has opened up all kinds of new um, and it ways for us to become energy independent and not uh, reliant on the Middle East's oil. Um, and the Middle East, even though it has oil, has often been a, a site of conflict and um, just instability. And OPEC, OPEC controls the price of oil, um, which is, OPEC is kind of a group of Middle Eastern countries that come together, and they come together because of a common economic interest, and they vote on the oil price, they vote on a number of policy issues regarding oil. and. And the problem has always been that um, they kind of would have control over the American economy in a way because they had all of the access to the majority of the oil. Well, now that America now ha can become energy independent um, based on finding the oil and the fracking procedure, that's really um, going to turn the tables and create an interesting dynamic for the future on energy policy and the Middle East for future. Right. So here's dependence on foreign oil. That now is coming down, given that we've found the majority of our oil for ourselves here, and then Canada has a bunch as well, and, and there's some offshore. So, environmental problems. So there's a number of environmental treaties out there. The Kyoto Kyoto is a town in Japan. The Kyoto um, standards, which which set limits on the number of carbons that can be released. And you see countries like this um, commit to holding the number of carbon producing things down and regulating that industry. And um, You see a number of other environmental efforts. It's very difficult to get large industrialized nations to agree to those things, especially as they're developing um, bigger and bigger economies, because that means somebody is going to now start to have to pay for that, pay for all the environmental additions to the factories and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of times, both the companies they want to pass the companies want to pass it on them. The customers, customers don't want that, or the companies are going to have to pay for it themselves. That means lower profits and lower everything, which is hard to do um, when you're in the middle of a very competitive market. Generally, um, most Americans know more about um, domestic policy than foreign policy, so you're more familiar with things that happen in America than um, issues that happen in the Middle East or with Russia or whatever. Um, there's a lot of pluralism. There's a lot of non-governmental organizations and other actors that do do foreign policy. They're interacting with foreign governments and, and helping to set policy. Um, in order to have a, this gets back to the size of the government, in order to have all these foreign policy tools, however, you need a big government to do so. 
as well. So as defense spending and defense policy making and kind of when you see wars, um, that increases the scope of government because we have to run those wars and, and pay for the wars and um, do logistics and all that kind of stuff. And so um, the question becomes, though, is our international relations undemocratic? Most people don't know a whole lot about what's going on on the international stage. A lot of the decision makers, the ambassadors, um, other people in the State Department are not elected officials, right? They're appointed. The Secretary of State's appointed by the President and goes through um, Congress for approval, but a lot of the kind of long term ambassadors and the people in those re arenas are unelected. Um, however, presidents are responsible, especially for their foreign policy decisions. Um, and, um, you know, Congress can be as well, depending on how it votes for wars and funding for different actions and the stances that they take. Um, there's not ever been a situation where a democracy has gone to war against another democracy, which is a pretty remarkable record when you think about it. Um, as I said, Congress can be held responsible because they approve the budget, but there's still a lot of decision makers in the foreign policy area as well, just like everything. Um, we still, as the United States, still hold the superpower status. Um, China is probably growing in there with us. I wouldn't say Russia is a superpower. It, it is a former superpower, which actually makes it maybe more dangerous because they still think they are. The question is, should we be policing the world, right? Um, if there are issues um, that require, um, you know, that are just what ISIS is doing, what's happening in Syria, those situations where the United States needs to intervene in order to preserve um, human dignity, human rights, and that kind of thing. A lot of people would say, yes, it's just a question of and intervene in what manner. Many other countries, um, almost all countries, would not be willing to put troops in harm's way for those kind of things. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but the United States can lead the way with airstrikes we see on ISIS, with sanctions in Syria, and um, those kind of things. In, the, in a new globalized world, as we talked about a minute ago, the economic impact of and minor decisions now is felt across the globe. And so it's a much trickier, more complicated marketplace to figure out. Then you have the environmental concerns that we mentioned before. There's over 2 million people employed in the Department of Defense. so the size of government to meet these challenges from a military standpoint is large.